right. Oh, that's right. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Karen McKee. I am with the um, James A. McKee Association. And again, I want to welcome everyone um, who is here today. We just like to have an idea of who is in the room. So I'm going to ask Gary, would you start and we'll go around and introduce ourselves? <coughs> yes, sir. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Which way do you want to go? It doesn't matter. Which I bet Becky is fine. Becky Campbell. Ted Campbell. Jerry Sutton. Don Hollister. Mark Crockett. Lawrence Randolph. Brian Carlson. Bruce Rickenbach. Sorry about that. David Turner. Doris Upshman. Jacqueline Hunt. Bob Harris. Paul Graham. Dan Kerrigan. Kate Anderson. William Toll. Carl Hyde. John Fleming. Megan Bachman. Oh, Sandy McKee Smith. Wardell Kirk. Oh, well, again, welcome one and all, and our coordinator of um, community conversations, Don Hollister. Would you take over and introduce, please? Uh, Chief Brian Carlson. <laughs> <laughs> when did you first come to the force? It was after. Uh, New Year's 2017, so this interim, I believe it was February, and then full-time June of 17. And you were uh, 12 years back, right? Correct. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was a uh, patrolman. I worked uh, three years and nights full time, and then I did go out to the ACE Drug Task Force for three months and um, resigned there and came back part time. And uh, I've been employed here in Yellow Springs for almost nine years. And we invite you to say whatever you want. <laughs> uh, are you sure about that? <laughs> well, it's nice to see everyone here today. Um, I wish everyone warmest and happy holidays. Um, we've had a rough couple of years. I think everyone has. Um, but we're gaining some good, strong ground. I've got a team that I'm increasingly proud of. A couple weeks ago, the village manager uh, worked out a law enforcement leadership course for me to take at the Southern Police Institute. It was amazing. Um, I sat for a week with 42 other law enforcement leaders from across the country and one from um, Australia. And we were by far the smallest police department in the room. <laughs> we introduced ourselves uh, as our title and then how many sworn we have. And at my table, I introduced myself as the police chief with 12 sworn, myself included. The gentleman next to me, um, 530 sworn. <laughs> and it went up from there. So they had, we had uh, NYPD, Boston, uh, it was amazing. I connected, uh, interestingly enough, with uh, a new chief in Hartford, Connecticut. And they have um, a sworn body, I think he said 530 officers, but it, it was interesting and he made the comment at lunch, our conversation, and he, he said, did you ever think that there'd be a couple of chiefs of police sitting around talking about how we're helping people? And I really thought about that, and in a sense, so much of what we do in law enforcement is crime-based, because that's really why we're here, but so much of our actuality is we are providing the community a service of public safety, and we are helping those in need. And I mentioned uh, we were going round table in the room, and. They were talking about ideas and things that have been implemented that you're proud of. And I mentioned um, 
our COS, Community Outreach Specialist, Florence. Of all the departments in the room, there was only one other department that had a Florence. And it became kind of a hot topic. Tell us more about this. Because everyone realizes the call for service ratio based on developmentally disabled, mental illness, substance abuse, and these are the things that Florence specializes in for us. And I, I want to mention this because I don't know how much it got around, but I have Florence do reports for me, for the department. And since Florence has been here in, from April, um, she's had uh, assisted four child welfare cases, one domestic violence, assisted five drug and alcohol, family violence abuse, five. Um, she's assisted five homeless people with food and gas cards that are provided from the community. Um, a couple of the local churches have uh, done a great job in bringing us um, food vouchers from Tom's and Speedway gas cards that officers and Florence can help people passing through town in need. And we burn through these like you wouldn't believe. Um, she's placed six homeless so far, and we're working on more. Um, mental health care and welfare, uh, she has 15 customers. Uh, the department through Florence and some churches have helped with uh, some rents. We've had two uh, suicide prevention cases, um, numerous transports, um, five people who've been able to keep their utilities on through connections Florence has made, and um, numerous wellness checks. Uh, but these type of things are the things that officers encounter as, as peace officers, but we're limited to uh, at the end of our encounter, I should say. So I get called on a welfare check. I meet Bob. I help Bob as best I can, and I'm off on my next call. With Florence, this becomes part of her caseload. And it's, it's been uh, an amazing asset to the department. She knows I can't say enough about what she's done. I, I want to mention this to you guys and I think that you'll see the humor in it, but when this all started, when Justice System Task Force Kate Hamilton brought this idea, and I really loved the idea, overall the questions were, what's this person going to do? Where, where, what are they doing? Why? What's going on? Now it's, where's Florence? <laughs> Do you know where Florence is? Have you got her number? And it's really become uh, an amazing part of the department. She's added quite a lot. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I have some statistics, things that have been asked for, and I didn't really want to get into that too much today. I wanted to kind of see if you could maybe utilize your questions, and I could answer anything that you may have. Um, can you tell us uh, how many hours you work? And yeah. you me? Right. Um, right now I work uh, Monday through Friday, 9 to 3, okay. in the office. And um, if there is a, a need for some service, um, they'll call me. The officers will call me okay. when I'm not in the office. Great. Could you elaborate on the um, community services that are available to you that you use in doing your work? Okay, I have a notebook about <laughs> So what, what happens is we categorize them and if there's someone that um, needs drug dependent or alcohol dependent, then we have a list of agencies that um, we refer them to. Um, but mostly, usually the first um, contact that most of the people that I uh, encounter um, endure is job and family services. And we use CAP, which is Community Action um, Project. We use them a lot because they have resources also. And so a lot of the people that need resources, although they're not housed in Yellow Springs, we have, we contact, um, make contact with them. Um, we use um, the um, Mental Health Board, NAMI, which is the um, a National Association for Mental, um, mental 
illness. illness. If you told this, it's a break. But um, children, family services, um, family violence, uh, we use um, um, the senior center. Uh, we've used um, some health agencies that are not in Yellow Springs, but people we've had one um, alcohol and drug rehabilitation that went through Columbus. Um, and that was by choice. The person chose not to be in the area because of people maybe knowing their situation or them, them not wanting to be exposed mm -hmm. here. Um, so we, we send them there, but we do use um, the Hope Spot, which is in um, Xenia, which cares for people with drug and alcohol um, issues. We use Haven. We use the Coach, which is drug and alcohol um, detox places. We use St. Vincent's, Paul. If it's a service or a resource, I can use it. I have access. <coughs> One thing I, I want to mention that I think uh, Florence and I are very attached to is we have started a um, reacclimation mentoring program with um, convicted felons who are incarcerated and will be re-entering Yellow Springs. Um, we we believe they'll be citizens. We welcome them back to the community. And so we've, uh, we've had one visit together to the Southeastern Correctional Facility. Florence went on a second visit that I was unable to go to, and then we have another one planned uh, December 17th. And um, we, we're trying to figure it out as we go, but um, I'm excited about the potential there as well. I know the village has had a lot of discussion around the concept of community policing and what that means for the village of Yellow Springs. So I'm kind of interested in both of your concepts of what uh, community policing involves. And the other part of that is, as a community, we would like to um, find out what are the best ways that we can help you on the department to support community policing in Yellow Springs. Just sort of your general concepts of what that means to you and what it looks like for your, uh, residents in the village. Well, we, we have a small enough department and village where I believe officers may not know everyone, but need to know this car belongs at this house. That dog goes there. <laughs> this bike is his, um, and part of that for me is the grassroots of what what I did when I came here. Um, they, it, it's not something that is necessarily trained because law enforcement as a whole deals with um, law, corrective behavior, tactical approach, <clears throat> the important things that that keep you know civilians and, and law enforcement people alive. But at the same time, in a small community like this, um, this, this type of personal visibility, um, the optic, the making eye contact, the hellos, um, you know, just mandating that our officers walk two hours a shift, in, in the initial stages, it kind of backfired in a way, because if they're not reaching, if they're not making contact, now they're just an occupying force. And, you know, we do have two communities, if you will, uh, you know, the, the day and the night. Um, the nighttime is when we see more of our violent incidents. That's when we see more alcohol use. Um, younger crowd, um, it's a little different. The daytime is, you know, we, we say day walkers, night walkers, but that's just not <laughs> um, So this driving around uh, patrol off the main drag, not so much traffic, um, engaging with community members. Um, if you see a moving truck pull up, <clears throat> are you moving in or are you moving out? Welcome to the community, hand them a, a chamber pamphlet, 
a map to the Glen. I mean, these are these are things that's not rocket science. And you know, we had a staff meeting the other day. I'm, I'm looking around the room and really realizing, you know, we are getting we are getting a, a tight, cohesive group. It's difficult. It's a difficult job to manage. We are constantly under the ever appearing eye of a microscope. And sometimes it doesn't come from a good place. Sometimes it is a sabotorial, that's a word, approach. And we have to deal with that and, and move on. I'm very proud of all the officers we have um, asking what the community could do. The biggest thing for me would be you do the same. When you see an officer, make contact, say hello, introduce yourself. My name's Brian. I, have, I don't recognize you. Um, I mean, you know, start that interaction as well. I think that that community policing works both ways. And right now, we're, we're still working through this us and them kind of national spotlight, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> And I ditto what he just said, um, but in, in my role, I also see that um, there's a lot of resistance to people um, in Yellow Springs being police. If you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's just a resistance, you know, and I, I will even mention maybe, you know, this resource or we could do this and that. Nah, it's kind of like they're standing off because of one reason or another. Some of that has to do with um, previous incidents or contact with the police. Some of it has to do with my neighbor's opinion of the police. Some of it has to do with where I came from and the police. So there are a lot of different issues that are going on within a person. So unless you get to know the person or speak, you know, with someone, you can't judge. And I find that, you know, after talking with people sometimes, you know, they say, oh, well, I didn't see it that way. Or, you know, just conversing with people, no matter what your version of what happened is, or no matter what your opinion is, you can still greet people and be a caring person and be concerned. And you don't have to agree, but in, in a community that we're all living in this community <coughs> together, and we want, first of all, all of us to be safe in the community, and we want all of, of us to be a community of caring people. Um, I mean, I guess that's drilled in me from, from my, my background and where I come up. Uh, uh, it's just a, caring, a group of caring people in the community seeking to transform this community. Um, that, that's, that's what I see and that's kind of how I'm approaching you know, the subject. So when, when I am dealing with people in the community, especially those who are kind of, you know, maybe I'm not sure if I can trust you or I'm not sure that I want your help yet, but let me, you know, let me think about it or, you know, just give me what you have and then I'll let you know. So that's kind of how the approach goes with me in dealing, especially with getting resources for people that need help. Sometimes the people need the help, they don't have um, any resources, or they don't have any family, they don't have any support system except, you know, I'm face to face with them and they say, I need this, but, or my family doesn't want to help me, and, you know, my friends in Yellow Springs will, but now my friends in Yellow Springs are tired of me, mm -hmm. taking care of me, you know, and some people just don't want the help, you know, they're not used to it. So it's just a matter of getting to know people in the community. We, we have, as, as we all know, such a warm, wonderful, I mean, this is an amazing community. It's, it's a, a tiny, tiny little blue dot in a red sea. Um, we have common mindset. We have um, caring individuals that, that encompass the, the community as a whole. Um, officers, and I didn't want to in any way come in and sound like we're, I'm in an excuse mode, but when you see an officer, and 
not in a, a professional way or that you just see an officer, you know, and you ask, how's your day? Um, you know, you, you might not get exactly the, not necessarily friendly, but the reply that you're looking for because that officer might have just spent the last four hours on overtime in a major catastrophe. <laughs> um, they might have been dealing with a suicide. They might have been dealing with a family member who just lost their uh, loved one. They might be um, dealing with an altercation of, of, of violence. Um, and that's the part of this job that we take that I drive home sometimes and I say to myself, even at my age, nobody told me that nobody calls the police when things are going good. <laughs> You know, and so it's constant. And so for me, part of, of the mission and job, and Florence as well, and she's been tremendous in the office for this, but that support amongst the peers in, how are you doing? How's it going? We know you just had this, this violent interaction. We know you just had to do something to someone you didn't want to. We know that you had to, you know, witness this. And, and the reaction is always, you know, I'm good. I'm good, man. How's it going? You know, it's like, well, you know what? So now we are mandating um, trauma therapy for first responders. It's wonderful. Uh, just it's group session. And everything stays in the room, and it's amazing how it allows officers to just kind of, you know, let it out. And that's been a miracle for us. Um, the notes that we get, the thank you for this. The, those mean a lot um, because those are, you know, the things that remind us really why we're here and what we do. Brian, have you made any changes, you kind of hinted at this early on, to your internal training following um, the recent incident of the gentleman that was... Um, Followed in a well, Jim. Yes. yes. Okay. I mean, that's the elephant in the room. I guess we want to know if you've made any changes, what recommendations you may have. Um, uh, absolutely. Um, you know that that situation. That's on me. That's you know this is one area that I may be wrong the next time in how I handle it, but it's going to happen. And I had a council person mention to me one night, go with your gut. And I, I said, can I do that? <laughs> no, and you bet I can. And so, you know, that's on the personal side of it. But to answer your question, yes. So we've had uh, two meetings. We have our first full four-hour scenario-based training, December 12th. It's closed to just the department because I want officers and dispatchers to kind of get a comfort zone going. We will be... Um, reviewing, discussing uh, scenarios that the committees put together. Mark Charles, uh, Naomi, Florence, and myself were the ones that kind of really had our hands in this. And we'll be looking at incidents across the country with U.S. police that were controversial in a bad or a good way. Um, you know, one of them that I found very interesting, which, which I think is not necessarily tailored toward, you know, the incident with Jim, but, you know, we get a lot of suspicious person calls. What's suspicious about them? Well, they, they look like they don't belong here. What makes them look like they don't belong? And as a police department, we have to follow up on every call. It's what we do. So when we get a call, and I found one <coughs> video, um, I think it, I, I found it on CNN, but it's, uh, African-American gentleman campaigning. He's in a white neighborhood. Um, he has his phone going, and the officer has his body cam going, and they play them side by side. And that one to me is critical because the officer really doesn't do anything wrong. It's just that the person that he encountered wasn't doing anything wrong. And so that's right where that that threshold is. That's right where, in all of these instances, you see the moment of departure. You see the moment of loss of contact. Sir, I need you to step out of the car. Game on. 
You know, do you have to do that? Did you have to try to open the car door at that time? Did you need to pull a taser on a guy at a street fair? Did, do, you know, so this video shows the officer showing up, sir, can I help you? And you know, the guy's like, no. You know, what do you need? He's sitting on the public right away and, and he knows what he's doing. I mean, it's, he's, you know, well, we have a call about a suspicious person. Well, I'm not suspicious. <laughs> What's suspicious about me? You look suspicious. You know, he's antagonizing, you get that. But part of our job is to understand the, the, the lines. And I thought, I, I put myself in those situations and think, well, what, what would I have done? Why do you guys want me to be the chief? And, you know, I, you lose a little bit of that mojo, if you will, um, you know, when, when you're constantly defending what your actions in the department. And I, I, I'm getting it back and realizing, you know, the reason is because of the way I handled things. And you want officers to behave and treat encounters like I used to do when I was a patrolman. And so that's my primary mission. Um, but in this particular video, the officer pushes for um, identification. If I encounter someone that was called in suspicious and I, hey, what's going on? Well, somebody called and said, they, you, you look suspicious. What's suspicious about me? Well, nothing. You doing okay? You having a good day? You know, my, my interaction would be to find out if this person had difficulty to find out if they were, you know, in talks, to find out if they had mental illness, to find out if they had a need, and then I would move to identification if I needed to. But if I didn't, hey, have a great day. Have dispatch call the caller back and say, sorry ma'am, there's nothing suspicious about this gentleman. And you're done. But the way it traditionally goes is, well, I need to see your ID. No. And now that line is crossed. And that's where, you know, that's on me to instill this, that it's okay for you to make the call and say, you know, I didn't find anything suspicious about this person. Well, what if he robbed a house? Well, at the time of your encounter, you didn't find anything suspicious out about this person. And so these are the, these are the situations that make it difficult in law enforcement because who, who, has the responsibility in the end. We do. And so we do have to check out every call. The difference is how we manage those, if that makes sense. You have a question there. I did. Um, regarding your job, um, I understand your hours. So my first thought is the nighttime and the weekend. Do you have uh, another means of people communicating needs, and where do they go when Florence isn't there to help? My, so I always have my cell phone with me, which is the word phone, and that number is public. And I do get calls when I'm away, and or you know, last weekend I went to Pennsylvania with my my family, and my to see my great grandchildren, and then you know, and I. I have my phone with me, so if there is a time when someone is in distress, they will call me and I can get back with them. And I can either direct them to someone who's in the area or one of the officers or the dispatch. Could you discuss how the changing demographics in Yellow Springs are affecting community policing? I kind of see that at some point there will be more elders than young people, but maybe the attention of the police will be on more the ratio to the young people will be greater. You'll be paying more attention to them. Or do you see the elders requiring more? Uh, I think, you know, cop stats suggest that the attention is always to the younger as far as call for service, mm -hmm. uh, urgency to need. Uh, but, but, you know, community members as a whole, we, you know, we make all kinds of service calls. I mean, and I'd urge everyone, anytime, something doesn't feel right, you just want us to drive by. We come by, we can call us, have somebody mention to the dispatcher, hey, have the officer stop by, I've, I've got some cookies. Um, just, you know, those kind of things are, you know, critical to, to kind of bring this fabric together. Right now, we are still in blue, and 
then there's the public. And I think, you know, times have changed. We can talk about the good old days, but it's not like that anymore. And, and I have to say it's very difficult to be a peace officer wherever you work and live there. It's difficult. Um, so those things to me are, I would love any, my door is open, I'd love any open, any comments or suggestions, things, you know, hey, I noticed your officer doing this. And, and you know, I take these things very seriously and, um, and we are getting to where the communication in our department is very open. I want officers to come in and tell me, you know, I'm not real happy with the way things went in mayor's court. Okay, you want to tell me why? Um, and, you know, we, we get things out. And, you know, Mayor Pam has, has been amazing. Um, that was another topic at this law enforcement leadership conference. I'm not sure if many of you may know, but there was only two states in the United States that have mayor's court. Mm -hmm. And when I mentioned mayor's court again, mm -hmm. you know, and here's the guy with 12 officers who they're asking questions to. And I'm thinking, <laughs> <laughs> But it, it is amazing. We, uh, Pam and I share the same vision of, you know, down the road. We would love to, to, to see a teen court grow out of Mayor's Court. And that's kind of a unique body of uh, 12 seniors who are interested in law from high school who sit on an adjudication panel. You know, you do need a, a sitting legal authority or solicitor. Um, but then local crimes that all juvenile cases go to juvenile, but then they decide which ones can be adjudicated locally and they kick them back and we have our team court. Um, Oakwood's had a successful one since, I don't know, the 70s? Um, so those kind of things are, you know, they're, they're huge. And I've got this huge marker board in my room because I'm old school. And, you know, I put all these great ideas up there and it's kind of like, Chiefing is what happens while you're busy being a police officer. You know, we'll get to that right after the fire. We'll get to, you know, and so this is where um, the interaction between the community and the department is pivotal. I know the village is um, has been designated as a dementia-friendly community, and I believe your department receives some training. How did that work for you? You know, Florence is on the committee, you want to? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it is, it's, uh, well, hopefully we're everything for you. Well, that's true, <laughs> that's true. But yeah, the dementia friendly, it's just kind of focusing, focusing on the, um, our older citizens who have needs that um, are different from the general population. Um, being alone, sometimes no children in the area, or just not being able to, um, maneuver the way they used to get up and down, you know. And so there they um, we have are just in the beginnings of having um, and I, I don't have the correct name for it, but it's with um, um, the gland of course or you know they can walk and get exercise and memory games and things that just keep them viable viable, you know, in, in their Situation. Some of them are home alone a lot, and so um, when there's something that they can't do, they need help, or, or or if they go into distress, you know, it's just being able to help them where they need help. So um, it's coming along. We're just in the beginning stages of it, but okay. yes, we've been designated dementia friendly. Great. I have two different things. One is a Thank you for your assistance to our personally with the tree fell on our house during the ice storm. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I mean, he even yeah. brought cough, hot coffee. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Always very, does the trick. <laughs> the second thing is, um, I've been trying to follow in the past year this uh, justice group that have kind of. Uh, overseeing, or they're overlooking the police department and that appears to me making suggestions and such for the police department. And now I see that I think they're coming into a second reading of making it a permanent 
thing as a justice uh, commission. System task force, excuse me. Uh, what, to me, it means uh, people, community members, overlooking the police department and advising the police department what to do when I think police know their job. They don't need lay people to tell them how to do it. That, that's the way it appears to me. Is there anybody in the room that can change that interpretation of what I see and, and read in the paper? Well, I can. <laughs> I, I think it, the intention I believe now is to kind of unify the task force with the police department. And before it was kind of an us and them. I know it wasn't intended that way, but that was, you know, that was inherited when I came in. And um, I'm hoping that the new formation of this will, it, it will encompass both the department and the community members on the Justice Task Force in these decisions rather than, you know, us not being privy or involved in the discussions until recommendations. Mm -hmm. And with that change, I think that that will be good. I can say that Florence came out of that so I do have that. Uh, Becky, mm -hmm. I think I could say a little something on, on the village council and, and was somewhat involved in setting up that initial justice task force. I think what's happened is, I mean, I moved here in 72, and in 72, I think all of the officers lived here. Everyone knew the officers, and it was that small town feeling of, community policing in actuality. Well, with your dad here. Over those 70, 80, 90, five, dec four or five decades, things have changed in the village and things have changed nationally. And I think policing has changed, and there's the word, it's become more militarized. But um, And during that time, I think there was a, started to be a separation between the police department in Yellow Springs and the people, or at least a lot of people have felt that. And um, that the mayor's court was not being used as much as it used to be. So I think the initial idea of the justice system um, was to help Yellow Springs in some ways get back to the way it was and to shift the trend that was happening nationally from police being more like, a, well, like you said, an occupying force, sort of, and seeing a criminal around every corner to making it more like, in some ways, like it used to be. Mm -hmm. I think that a, big, a, a lot of what's going to happen with that is a function of what council decides it wants to do with the recommendations from the commission. Another significant chunk of it is who is on the initial uh, commission itself, what kind of agendas they have or don't have, and how they interact with all the various players. I agree, I think that it, in, a, in some cases it's sort of admitting defeat, uh, because if we need a permanent group that's constantly watching over these kinds of things to make recommendation to council to tell the police what to do or not to do, we've failed as a community to figure this out. Uh, so I think it's a, I think that you know what you guys need to do, as I've said a number of times, is figure out what you're going to do with the recommendations. And Marianne is the only one with a good idea, which is to put everything, all the recommendations in a box and then look at them all at once instead of a piecemeal response, which is what happened in the past. I'm still going to be hopeful, though. I hope that you don't pick people with real serious agendas either. Yeah. I don't think you will. I'm also hoping about that. <laughs> We had a lot of that in the past, and we still do. I think one of the functions of the task force may include um, sort of being the eyes and ears 
in, of the community where officers, as you indicated, sometimes you're so focused on a specific issue that you're dealing with, you may not have an opportunity to hear the concerns or the needs or the interests of the community <coughs> and that they is a, a form where the community can um, go to to express those concerns and that way it's not mu as much of an oversight from my perspective as just um, a partner and again trying to implement this thing that we're talking about community policing has changed the definition over the years a million times for where it used to be um, but that's from my perspective it's just another way to communicate or facilitate communication between the community and the department mm -hmm. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, um, anybody that wants to downplay or overlook the uh, problem of organized stalking in America um, becomes a part of that problem. And uh, I've been to village council meetings and uh, justice system task force meetings, and uh, I've express my concern of the, this problem. And uh, to summarize, basically, uh, if you interfere with uh, corrupt lawyers or drug houses or anybody involved with uh, illegal activity, whether it's moral or not, if it involves big money, then uh, you can be targeted and uh, stalked and harassed. So I came to Yellow Springs to be safe and uh, I would like to say also that um, uh, to the chief that I'm, I'm not sure it's a good idea to, uh, if there's a suspicious person, to uh, overlook them because uh, I used to live in Yellow Springs previously and the problem that I've noticed uh, from the way it used to be when McKee was chief, uh, there was more regular officers, there wasn't such a rotating uh, uh, bunch of police officers coming and going so then not everybody knew them. And then uh, what happened was uh, I was going for a walk like I always do in the evening and uh, I was approached by an officer that didn't know me because she was new and uh, she uh, wanted to know if everything was okay. Well, obviously everything's okay if I'm walking down the street, you know. <laughs> so uh, same street I've been walking down for who knows how long. Okay, and she's the new person here. So um, she called for backup, I was arrested and everything, and then they let me go eventually, but uh, it was a big hassle, so I wrote the newspaper about it, and uh, this was back in the 90s, and uh, so basically I, I've seen it gradually, uh, you know, I've seen it how it changed from how it used to be, so, and it, this isn't just a local thing, it's a national thing, so, uh, I'm not sure what the solution to the problem is or, or the uh, all the answers, but um, that's what I have to say, and thanks for listening. Do you feel safe now, though? I mean, that occurred back in the 90s. Do you feel like you now have a better idea of who the officers are, and more importantly, they know you, so that you don't experience that any longer, or is that the well, case? In, in Yellow Springs, anyways. I mean, yeah. I, in Xenia, I'm aware of uh, some bad things going on that I, I don't want to be in the middle of anything, and uh, I just want to stay out of it. So uh, if I know there's something going on in a certain neighborhood, I just drive around that neighborhood mm -hmm. and uh, try to stay away from the places I know that are bad places and, and or sense. bad people. and. Uh, but, but I'm aware of people that, that uh, there's a police report that I filed against one of the stalkers and they bought a house in Yellow Springs and uh, the police know who they are so hopefully I'll be safe and, and it's disturbing that I moved here last year in the spring and then he bought a house in December of last year mm -hmm. so there's something uh, Strange there, you know, and he, and he moved from Dayton, which is, mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a connection, but that's where that corrupt lawyer was from that I didn't hire for, for a wrongful death, uh, which involves a lot of money, you know. Mm -hmm. So there you go, big money, and then there's a drug house in Xenia that I moved away from, big money, mm -hmm. you know, and I try to stay away from it all. Mm -hmm. So that's why I came to Yellow Spring. 
Well, hopefully you do feel safe and the yeah. department is aware of the case. Thank you. Yeah, I do feel safer except for when people try to downplay, you know, my concerns because of whatever this or that history. It ain't my problem. I came from a, you know, effed up family. <laughs> That's not my problem. I'm responsible for myself, not my, not my family's history or not anybody else's history. That's true. Well, mm -hmm. again, we hope that you're feeling safe in the community because that's the, obviously the goal. Yeah, I do feel safer mm -hmm. and I feel safer coming to meetings and let like, other people know my concerns. Good. Because the world is watching, you know. It's true. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about uh, the uh, changing uh, environment like storms and natural catastrophes and of course that seems to be happening more and more regularly now than in the last few years uh, does our police department interact with surrounding police departments in the case of a, of a storm for instance it floods a community or uh, a catastrophe where the community has to be evacuated or even let's say a shootout you know where you need backup do you interact with Xenia or Fairborn or Springfield police departments, or how does that work? Yes, all <coughs> Green County police departments. Um, we have a public information sharing network. Um, the emergency management plans are in place. Um, we're fortunate. That's one advantage of a hometown department. Um, Green County works the closest with us because they are part of our, we had the ice storm, was it two weeks ago now? Um, it didn't seem like it was very bad, but it was, uh, we had every available resource at its limit. I mean, poles down, trees through roofs, um, trees across roads. I was out at Grinnell and Clifton, and county was there, and we were moving trees, and I mean, it's just, for me, that's part of the work that is inspiring. You go through the the, the day, and you, you know, you're going home exhausted, and you're just feeling like, wow, I am so lucky to be working with people like this that that care. Um, flooding that hasn't been something that you know we've talked about as uh, law enforcement. Well, we live on a plateau in Yellow Springs, <coughs> so the water flows downhill. Mm -hmm. There's a few spots in town where it's good. But yeah, I think, was it two years ago? Remember when we had the flood and it was coming down Zinni Avenue? Oh, yeah, yeah. Very good. Yeah. Um, but you're right, it does disperse quickly. Mm -hmm. Brian? Can you tell, you said you had 12 sworn officers. Can you tell us their names, who they are? Oh, sure. Um, well, we've got myself, uh, Dennis Nipper. I'm sure most of you know Dennis. Um, Doug Andrus. He's a part-time officer. Um, David Meister. Uh, Mark Charles. Paul Rafool. Paul joined us uh, right about when I started, uh, when I did my officer search. Paul was one of the two officers that were brought in. Uh, amazing if you meet Paul, introduce yourself. Uh, he's, he's a real real good fit here in Yellow Springs. Uh, Stephanie Bennington, um, she left the department before I came on as chief and she was one of the first phone calls I made. Would you come back? Um, and she did. Uh, Naomi Watson, Josh Knapp, both sergeants. Jeff Bean, I'm not sure if you guys have met Jeff. Uh, Jeff, Mark, Paul are working evenings and nights, so you're probably not as familiar with them. But um, it, again, if you see someone in blue, say hey, flag them down. Say hey, I'm, I'm Brian Carlson, right? My kids went to Mills Lawn. Huh? Have you been here long? <laughs> you, know, you can give them the third degree. <laughs> um, that really will help. How many are on day shift? How many are on night shift? I try to have two officers on at all times. 
Um, we're going to be doing a new schedule starting January 1st. Um, the open spot we typically have with one officer is uh, 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. But we're trying to fill that void. It is the quiet zone until it's not. <laughs> and then what happens is uh, someone's usually on standby. And, and I'll come in. <laughs> Um, earlier this year, we had the superintendent of the uh, Career Center here, and he made the comment that to be a, a licensed beautician in Ohio, it takes a thousand hours of training, and to uh, be certified to be hired as a police officer, it takes 750 hours. Uh, at least that's my memory. What? Uh, What about training? What? Well, training is huge. It's, it's, it's a big line item in our budget. Um, we utilize it to the fullest. Um, it's, it's ongoing. So with uh, peace officer training in Ohio, um, you have the, the obvious certification annual, semi-annual, uh, firearms, um, use of force. You know, these are things that you might not necessarily ever use in your career, um, but when you do, you better know what you're doing. Um, and then we also are mixing in there now the, the things that I think that, that you want the village to aspire to. And, and those kind of things are the community style policing, um, the scenario-based training that's I'm real excited about. Um, because these are the things that we don't talk about enough. Um, we, we need to watch the John Crawford incident in, in, in a closed setting and talk about it. We need to understand what we should do. How do we handle identifying someone? What's the need? What's the urgency? Um, these kind of things. We also need to continue the constant, you know, care and watch for some of our uh, troubled community members that that we talk to and see on a daily basis. And those interactions are important. Brian, how's it going today? Oh, it's not so good, you know. And, um, and that's an advantage or a luxury, if you will, that we can have in a small community. We came here today to talk about community policing and to Karen's point, you start looking up definitions of community policing and there are so many and they go off in so many different directions but we have the luxury because we are a smaller community to craft community policing to what we want it to be so that it fits into our community lifestyle if you will to the degree that it satisfies it satisfies the citizens who live here in the community. Now, um, one thing, especially those of us of a certain age in this room, we hearken back to the days when we saw police officers out walking the beat, getting out of their cars, taking a loop around in front of the Toms, down to the, past the hardware store, back down by the gas station to the village building having an opportunity to talk to the citizens. We talk about us approaching them and asking them, how's your day, and so forth. It'd be great to have an opportunity to do that by seeing the officers walk the beat. Hey, we can do that. It's our community. And I'm sure the officers might enjoy a chance to stretch their legs and get out and meet more folks. I don't know. But maybe you can enlighten us, Chief, about the possibility of, of having more direct contact with the officers. Well, we do need to be out and about more. I don't, I don't think that there can be enough of that. Um, we're busy. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, running to Tom's to grab lunch for everybody at the office is, you know, sometimes difficult. Um, the, the night shift, that's a difficult 
time to be on foot patrol. Nobody's downtown except at the bars, and that's where we're typically on calls. So I'm trying to kind of figure a balance out there um, as we have a little bit of downtime with the cold weather season approaching. But I am definitely amping up our bike usage. So we've got another officer through the bike training now. We'll have four. Um, we're putting uh, the bike hitches on the new cruisers. Um, and we're going to be active in that. I have, I have to have one officer on when I have an officer on a bike. But I'm excited about that. We are a bicycle community. That will get us out into the public more. Yeah, I wouldn't suggest having an officer out at night, but perhaps during the day when more folks are downtown, mm -hmm. to increase the visibility would be good for both the, the officers and for the department and for our citizens. Right. So that might be helpful. Be a more naturalistic sort of setting. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to ask you when you were at your recent conference. I know you talked to chiefs of large, multi hundreds, hundreds of officers in the department. Were there any breakout sessions for smaller communities such as ours, where you could get information or converse with like-minded chiefs? I think it it steered more toward like-minded from a value perspective, uh, you know, it was definitely the, the more liberal communities were kind of, we found each other and, you know, and it's difficult because, you know, you, uh, but to answer your question, no. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the next smallest department, there was one small one from Henderson, Kentucky, at 35 sworn. Um, but we kind of latched on after we heard comments through situation and, you know, hey, did you want to get together for lunch today? And, and so that's kind of how it worked. <coughs> this gentleman. When an officer or dispatcher is new to Yellow Springs, what's their process for getting acclimated? Well, first you have to um, meet the OPATA requirements, Ohio, Ohio Police Officer Training Association, um, and that's, they call it a field training program. So there's weeks of riding with other officers that are field trained supervisors. Um, and then after that, the plan so far has been that they spend time with me. Um, we need to really kind of grow that into, um, a longer process, if you will. Um, we want to get officers, because of staffing needs, out on their own as soon as we can. But we also want them to understand the style of policing that we expect. That's where it's on me. And this is an area where I will not compromise again. Um, it's according to what Dennis told me that your father said when he was hired we do things a little differently here if it doesn't work out for you I'll help you find another job yeah. and you know I need to be a little bit more firm with that message um, unfortunately we tend to gravitate toward the negative side of things that happen, but you know, we've had two hires in two years, and one of them is just amazing. And we got super lucky with Paul. And, and he's kind of unknown right now because of the shift he's on, and, but if you, if you do have the opportunity um, ever to see him or stop by, or definitely make contact. Let's share, share a couple of things stepping back. Uh, I'm talking about community involvement. Uh, I was blessed enough to be a part of the Los Angeles Police Department's DART unit, the Crisis Intervention DART Domestic Abuse Response Team. Uh, as we were volunteers, but we were state certified. So we were actually first responders on call. So 
the precinct that I worked out of, which was the 77, was considered the most violent in Los Angeles. But when it came to domestic violence, it actually had one of the lowest numbers because of the interaction that was allowed to happen. Yeah, you had officers that were the first responders, but we were the second ones through the door. And so we could deal with the issues immediately. And so it de-escalated from them dealing 100% with men in blue and seeing someone that they could actually have confidential conversations with. We were also allowed by the state to, all, uh, to present temporary restraining orders on site. And so that allowed them to, to change their perception and their interaction with the police department. Now Los Angeles, the second largest city in the US, each precinct was a community unto itself. So you could do the more community activities or each precinct, you know, determine how their community needed to be dealt with. But the point I was making is that when Karen, for instance, mentioned dementia community, when you start involving people who have backgrounds and expertise in these areas to be able to t offload some of the responsibility from officers so that you can do more of the mandated stuff, then that also changes the perception of the law enforcement in the area because some departments go on the mandate of we protect property as opposed to doing, interacting with people and their needs and issues because you're not necessarily as officers trained uh, to stay there with that person until the situation is calmed, resolved. You know, for instance, uh, just talking about domestic violence, the officers in Los Angeles really had to be trained as to who was the perpetrator when they went on site. You know, you would see a child holding on to one parent and assume that the other parent was the perpetrator of child abuse when it was that parent that they were clinging to because they were seeking the love of that parent. You know, so we had officers that would immediately go on site and assume the male was the perpetrator when it's 50-50, you know. Um, and the other thing I want to throw out real quick is I was part of, go with the team court, I was part of the first training groups when Department of Justice stepped in to do the training for team court. And it's grown and it works. You know, when you have it properly in place, it helps, it works. Uh, peers have a tendency to be a lot more stringent with peers than the, uh, the judicial system might be. And so peers get peers in line, you know, and stuff. But to circle back, looking for more of how you can involve community or people of the community to do a lot of the work that people are looking at officers to do could help. Very good. There's another training, the CIT, which is a criti critical intervention training that officers go through mm -hmm. that they deal with each one of those different scenarios and different opportunities to be um, in contact with different groups of people. Mm -hmm. So they are trained in that. It's that they might not be part of the 750 hours to become an officer, but after that, there is training yeah. so that they're able to deal with different situations. Yeah, and, and, I'm, and I'm aware that my point was that to allow the officer to move on to the next uh, incident, you know, uh, when you have volunteers that are trained to be able to keep the, handle the situation on site, you know, a lot of times that helps too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, I want to just mention, that I just I don't know if this falls under exactly being policing, but I really do appreciate the police taking interest again in the the incredible ballet in the morning in front of Mills Lawn. I know you can't be at the, the junior high, but it is really important to help with the general safety, of course, you know, escorting the kids in and out and making sure that there's good order. But uh, I think that's an important thing that was dropped for, for I don't know what reasons. 
and that, I'm very glad I saw you this morning, and I've seen you many mornings in the front there. So as long as you can fly, that's an important It's avenue. important for me. It makes my day. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an important thing. It can be a little frightening to be the human shield. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you're doing it for a good cause. But, you know, it's funny because at the beginning of the year, you know, there's kids are looking up at the big creepy guy in blue and now it's high fives and you know and that's important because down the road you know we'll, we'll still be together um, I, I, yeah I, I think you know Joseph Wamba uh, the writer uh, referred to being a policeman as like dealing with people's problems all day long because somebody's done something stupid they've made a mistake something's gone wrong it's always that dumping on that you now I got to whatever resolve whatever's going on and that's not such a pleasant day in day out thing some people are very called to it some people are not but I think that's a very important simple thing it's only whatever 15 minutes 15 magic minutes and then it's but it's very I you know I my wife and I were on the safe routes to school and we thought it was so important and not just for the safety of the kids in that area, but also just as a mentoring thing, you know. Oh, he's yeah. he's the chief, you know. So thank you. I appreciate it. I like to tell three stories. We lived here almost 50 years and raised four sons who did all the usual things that boys do, uh, <laughs> interacting with the police. Yeah. Um, but we've had three. Uh, interactions with the police. Since most of what you hear is uh, suggestions and bad news, I'd like to tell three good stories. The first one <clears throat> happened some years ago. All three, each of them was under a different chief, by the way. Um, we were keeping a dog for one of our sons, and he uh, ran out of the electric fence and was running around and I heard him barking, and I went to see where he was, and he was holding an SUV at bay. <laughs> and behind that was a truck, and behind that was a police car. Jerry Green was the policeman at the time. And Jerry looked at me and said, we have a leash law in this town. And I have walked our dogs on leashes ever since. That was more than 10 years ago. That was a good uh, instance of community policing. The second one, my wife and I were driving on uh, Main Street, going north, heading toward town, and driving very slowly because we were looking for something. I don't remember what. The police car pulled in behind us and hit the siren, and we stopped. He walked up to the window and said, is there something wrong? Can I help you in some way? We said, no, we were just looking. He said, okay, we'll this one. The third one was uh, in the power outage before this last one. We had to go somewhere to a, a doctor's appointment, I think. And the power was out, and it uh, turns out there was one spring in the door of our garage that was broken. Um, I didn't know what to do because I couldn't raise the garage door myself, so I called the police. And Rita was the dispatcher. And I told her what the problem was, and she said, oh, I'll send my chief. And she did. <laughs> You noticed, that the spring, and you noticed that the spring was broken and it was fixed almost immediately. And the last power outage, I raised the garage. <laughs> we, as I say, we've had nothing but good experiences with the police. I, I, you know, all this other stuff may be helpful, but I think you needed to hear about some good things too. Oh, I appreciate it. And we do. I, you know, it's, I guess, uh, I was talking with Megan yesterday and you know it's like I, I don't want to always seem like I'm in the defensive mode you know but it seems that you know, with the growth of social media and, and you know, public access and you know, there's cameras everywhere and you know you're constantly you know we, we have what I consider now like the trifecta so it, you know it used to be you did this because you had a following which I think most just about every officer I've ever met since I've done this has. Um, and then you have to respond according to the law and follow policy and you're constantly thinking. But now there's that third variable, how's this going to look? And 
you know, sometimes you can't worry about that. You have to do what you do, and then you face the choir afterwards. Um, but that's where this scenario-based training uh, I'm excited about. And actually, Council Brian, Brian House really kind of pushed this idea um, because we're gonna we're gonna be able to use actual incidents, enact them. Um, officers will be able to use their style, and then it's not so much that we're on the spot critiquing each other, but we're it's very similar to the CIT method of training. Um, which, by the way, TCN and Dr. Franklin Holly has volunteered a couple of his staff members to assist us. They're very good in their acting. Um, but this way we can say, you know, Brian, what you did is within the law, but what if you said this? And, you know, a, a simple example is a bar fight. Serious 911 call. The call is someone looks like they're being abducted down the alley. What do we do? We show up. That's what we do. And what happens when we show up? Everyone scatters. <laughs> so there's a couple people left, and the officer has an option at that moment. The first interaction, the first words out of their mouth. They can be, who's been fighting? Right? Which is within policy, reasonable. We got a call for that. Is it what I would recommend? No. <laughs> or, is everybody okay? You know, there's no difference tactically. I can still use my tactical training, my, my positive stance, you know, all that. But it's that initial verbal interaction. It's that greeting. It's that first impression that can change the course of the whole incident. And that's what I want to really start working on. Mm -hmm. Well, we are almost out of time. Does anyone else have anything else they would yes. like to say? I think one thing that the community can do is, of course, directly thank officers, mm -hmm. but also send a letter to council, send an email to council, write something in paper. Because there can be a certain viciousness, I think. Um, and a small group of people can get a lot of traction on things that may not have even really happened. Uh, a lot of negativity. So I think sharing the positive things that happen publicly certainly must be good for the officers. <laughs> uh, but also good for the community to know about it too. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll take a rain check on your 66 <coughs> just for the giggles. Okay. Thank you. That's all. I, just, I just want to say thanks. And, uh, You're welcome. Uh, like one positive interaction was uh, one time a guy I filed a police uh, report against walked by and uh, hopefully they'll leave me alone. And then it just so happened that about 30 seconds later the chief came by and uh, I happened to be blowing bubbles and he was like, he was like, well, just keep blowing bubbles, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so that was a positive interaction because I was like, maybe everything will be fine, you know? I like bubbles. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. All right, again, I want to thank you guys for coming and sharing. Um, I just also want to let the community know that our December community conversation is being suspended for the holiday, but we will begin again in January and uh, as well as February. And Don, do you want to tell them what those programs are? Do we? In January, the tree committee will okay. talk about their work. And in fact, we haven't, uh, the February is, is open. It's open. We will be having a Black History program but we haven't finalized the actual speakers then. So again, the James A. McKee Association is a civic organization. What we try and do is address really important issues that we think are significant to the community. We are open uh, for membership and those of you who may be interested, please feel free to contact. Yes sir? Uh, can you say something about the 25th? 
anniversary party that you prepared exactly. for that? Exactly, exactly, we'll certainly say that. Well, for these uh, people, no, no. All right, to all of us, exactly. We are planning a 25th anniversary celebration. We were going to have it in December, but we have decided to change the date uh, until spring. So look out for information. We'll send out save the date notices and what have you. This is an organization. In fact, I think this is probably one of the oldest organizations in Yellow Springs. They're doing a little bit of research. I think the Odd Fellows might be um, kind of close and close to us. But we would encourage you to look out for that information as well. So again, membership is um, open to those who are interested in working with the community. I'm mean, with this um, group to serve our community, and please feel free to contact either myself um, at 767-4641 or through our um, website. We have a website that is www.45387.org, and we also have a Facebook page, which is the James A. McKee Association Facebook page. So, um, one last note. Yesterday was Giving Tuesday, and this organization is listed as one of the nonprofits who are uh, receiving contributions. So any of you who still have an interest, you can just go on to ysgivingtuesday.org and find the James A. McKee Association logo, and please feel free to, um, to make a donation. So again, thank you all for coming, and I appreciate your attendance. Thank you.